Get Rich Education is brought to you by Norada Real Estate and GREturnkey.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Welcome to Get Rich Education, episode 143. Hi, I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Today, we're talking about amplifying your wealth with a 1031 exchange, also known as a tax-deferred exchange, and how it helps you build your wealth This is a great gift that the IRS gives you as a real estate investor, and it's designed to help you grow your portfolio. In fact, with little additional money out of pocket, on my first 1031 exchange, I was able to sell apartments that yielded $1,500 in cash flow and get rid of those and exchange them for apartments that created $3,500 in cash flow. So let's say that you've got 45% equity in a single family income property. What you can do is sell it, and then you might get a hold of 40% equity out of it after you pay sales commissions and make ready expenses. But with that 40% equity, you might be able to trade in that one property for two similar properties with 20% down payments on each of those two. Now you've got two properties, whereas you just started with one tax-free, or actually I should say tax-deferred, And there's no limit to the number of times that you can do this throughout your real estate investing career. So therefore, any capital gains tax liability can essentially be deferred forever. I've never paid any capital gains tax in my 15-year real estate investing career. Now, in the United States, when you sell your property, you must typically pay tax on your gain portion. Let's say that a few years ago, you bought a property for $100,000 in this year. You can sell it for $150,000. Okay, what you must pay on that 50 k gain is federal capital gains tax, which would take at least a 15% bite out of your gain for most people. And you might have state tax on top of that as well. For example, California has its own capital gains tax of 9.3% on top of the 15% federal And then real estate investors also have to pay something called depreciation recapture in every state. Depreciation recapture on that 50K. Yes, sorry, that depreciation that you wrote off every year needs to be paid back upon the sale. That is unless you perform a 1031 exchange. Okay, you can defer that gain and not have to pay a single penny. Yep, you can defer all of it. The federal capital gains tax the state capital gains tax, if that applies with where you live, and all depreciation recapture. And by the way, it's called a 1031 exchange because section 1031 of the United States tax code is where you'll find this rule. Now, why would you want to do a 1031 exchange instead of a cash out refinance? Well, cash out refinances are nice because you don't have to follow all these 1031 exchange rules that we're going to get into but 1031 exchanges are nice because this way you can remove all of the equity from your property by selling it. And with a cash out refi, you might have to leave 20 or 25 or 30% equity inside a property. But I've got a little trick to share with you in a few minutes where you can do both the 1031 and also access some tax-free cash. All right, well, why else might you want to use a 1031? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Let's say you want to peel off a dog. If you've got a property that's had some good equity buildup, but yet it really isn't cash flowing well, that's a good candidate to use. If you've owned a property for a while and you feel like some major maintenance items might soon be due, that can be a good reason to do a 1031. That way you can trade it in for some newly renovated turnkeys. Or let's say you're in a place where you've already got eight of your 10 Fannie and Freddie finance property positions already taken. Well, you could trade in two single family homes for, say, one fourplex, and now you've got better cash flow and only seven of your 10 slots have been taken. Or another thing that you can do is simply trade lower cash flow properties for better cash flow properties. And at the same time, whenever you do an exchange, 
you typically get a chance to control more property, you can reset to a higher leverage ratio, you'll often get better cash flow, you increase the monthly principal paydowns made by the tenants, and with more loans, you've improved your inflation hedging positioning as well. Now, let's kind of stick with that earlier example. Let's say you bought a property a few years ago for 100 k and you can sell it for 150 k this year. With your 50 k capital gain, you can defer all the tax on it. And here's what you would need to do. Before you sell the property that you're exchanging out of, get a qualified intermediary involved. This is your 1031 exchange facilitator. I'll just call this the QI hereafter. Choose your QI carefully. Get someone experienced. I found my first one from my first exchange through my local real estate investors meetup. And that QI has been doing this for decades. By the way, they're called Alaska Exchange Corporation. From the date that you sell your property, let's say it's January 1st, you have 45 calendar days to identify your replacement property. So let's say you must do that by February 15th. From the date of your sale, you have 180 calendar days to close upon on the replacement property. We'll call that July 1st. And now I'm sure there are a few more than 180 calendar days between January 1st and July 1st, but I'm just trying to simplify the example here. So within your 45-day identification period, which is a crucial period for you, you must select from three different identification methods. You must select from either the three properties rule or the 200% rule, or thirdly is the 95% rule. Now the three properties rule basically says you can identify three properties at any price. This is the most common one that I see people use. It's my favorite. And that means that you can close on either one or two or three of the properties that you've identified. The second one, the 200% rule, there's an unlimited number of properties that you can select with that but they can total no more than 200% of the value of what you've just sold your property for. That could work well if you want to get smaller properties. And then finally, the 95% rule. This is one that's not used very often, and it is for the highly savvy investor. You can pick as many properties as you want with no price limit. Okay, that sounds amazing, doesn't it? No limit in the number of properties or the price. But the big catch with the 95% rule is that you have to close on at least 95% of the properties you identify. So this might be for that savvy investor that has selected 20 properties and then they need to close on at least 19 of them. This investor that uses a 95% rule, they're often likely to have all cash so that they don't get hung up on financing snags among all those properties. I've actually never met someone that's used the 95% rule. So those are the three rules. And what you need to do on the replacements is you need to give exact addresses, legal and or street addresses of the properties. You can't be nebulous and just say that I'm going to get a duplex in San Antonio. Okay, you need to be exact. So the basic point with an exchange is that you have to put in equal or more money and buy equal or larger valued property. Now, it's going to be important for you to get in the deal flow when you're doing your exchange because there are not any extensions. There aren't any exceptions to those rules. If you don't identify appropriately in the 45-day period or close in 180 days, your QI will send you your money, 50K in this example, back to you and you'll pay tax on it. And as far as the property you replace on, as far as the intent and the length of ownership, there really isn't any hard rule, but case law sort of argues that you need to own that replacement income property for at least two years to have a safe harbor. Now, sometimes people have asked me the question throughout my life, like, now, why would I ever want to sell a cash flowing property? And I think I've given you some answers for it right there to get more or larger or better cash flowing property. And, you know, some people look at their properties as just buy and hold that one property forever, but it often makes more sense to look at them as buy and hold for five years or 10 years or 12 years or four years and then exchange it for something bigger. A 1031 exchange is also called a like kind exchange. What is like kind? Well, it's pretty flexible. You could sell rental single family homes and replace them with even more single family homes. You could sell an apartment building and replace it with a number of single family homes. 
you could sell an apartment and buy office space or raw land. I mean, yes, the answer is yes to all of those scenarios, just about any non-owner occupied property, okay? In fact, in the same exchange, I've sold two apartment buildings and traded them up for two larger apartment buildings, and that was all just in one exchange. So there's some pretty good flexibility on the like kind part, but you cannot get foreign property involved. That's something that won't work. You also cannot take property equity and move it over onto the debt side, like with mortgage notes. Okay, that won't work either. Really, a top tip is be sure to get your QI, your qualified intermediary, involved early. You cannot close escrow on the property that you sell and then file for the 1031 later because you've already touched the money. If you don't get a good QI referral from others, then see who your title company recommends for you to use as a QI. And a $1,500 fee, that's the highest exchange fee that I've ever paid for a transaction. QI fees are really pretty low relative to the dollar amounts of the properties that you're going to get involved in this. So the QI holds on to your funds between the time that you've sold your relinquished property until the time that you close on the replacement or replacements. You can't touch the money. That goes to the QI at closing. If you take any money away from the QI, I mean, you can. It's yours, but it's considered boot, and you will be taxed on that amount. One tip I give people before doing a 1031 is that I'd like to see you have some liquid dollars on hand while this is going on. That's because if the money that your QI has from the sale of your relinquished property, if that ends up falling a little short on the down payment that you want to make on the replacement property, you're going to want to have some liquidity to fill in that gap. And then on the other side, the other thing that can happen is that you might have a little bit too much money at the QI compared to what's needed for the down payment on your replacement. And if that's the case, you might end up doing something quirky like make a 23% down payment or a 26% down payment on a property when you might have only needed to put 20% down, but see, at least you used up your equity and you did not get taxed on it. And if you make, say, a 26% down payment on a property just to use up your funds without creating boot, then after you've closed on your replacement property, what you can do is a cash out refinance sometime after your 1031 exchange closes out. So really, that's my top tip right there for you getting tax deferral. And then later, you can get your hands on tax-free money as well when you do that refi following your 1031. And the great thing about a 1031 is it does not need to be done inside of your IRA or anything. It can all be done inside your LLC or your personal name, however you're holding title to your property. And 1031s are only necessary for investment properties where you have a capital gain. If you don't have any gain, then there isn't any need for you to do a 1031. Let your buyers and sellers know that your deals are in a 1031. It's even a good idea to put that right in the purchase and sale contract. Part of that is effectively as sort of an exclamation point on the time is of the essence goodwill. You can also do a reverse exchange. That's in case you identify your replacement property before you sell the property that you want to get rid of. Now, that sounds like some nice flexibility for you, and it is, but remember that you would have to have the down payment cash to close on your replacement property before you sell your old one and get the proceeds out of it. So this is really a long-term game changer for you, the 1031, and there's no limit to the amount of times that you can do this in your real estate investing career. Upon your death, the basis steps up so that your heirs don't have any tax liability either. But in the interim, if you plan to completely abandon real estate investing, you have to pay it all back. But the idea is to keep rolling it over until you, well, pass away. 1031s are for investment property, not primary residences on either side at all. Now, with primary residences, as you might already know, if you have a gain, it is all tax exempt up to $250,000 worth of gain if you're single or $500,000 worth of gain if you're married. That's actually IRS section 121. So long as you've lived in the property any two years of that last five, you qualify for this primary residence capital gains tax exemption. I know that's a big mouthful there, but if in any of the previous five years, you live there for two years and that two-year living period in that property does not have to be consecutive, you don't have to pay any tax on the gain up to those thresholds. Now, one thing I've actually seen people is they do this. They 
buy a rental, they own it for some period of time, and then they move in for two years. And then after those two years, they sell it and they get the tax exemption for up to $500,000. They're a married couple, so they get the full 500K. Next, I'm going to bring in Highlands Residential Mortgage Senior Loan Officer Extraordinaire Graham Parm to discuss 1031s. Now, neither Graham nor I are advisors or QIs. We've just both done 1031s as investors, and he's seen 1031s from the lender perspective. I bet there'll be a little crossover with what we've discussed so far, but that might be all right because this is quite a nuanced topic today. That's next. You're listening to Get Rich Education. Cashflow real estate investors nationwide and worldwide, this is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. Our good friends at Mid South Homebuyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated, even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. Mid-South Homebuyers Friendly Staff makes investing easy. Learn more at midsouthhomebuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. This is our Rich Dad, Poor Dad author, Robert Kiyosaki. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. And the reason I respect Keith, he's a very strong, smart, bright young man. Welcome back to Get Rich Education, Highlands Residential Mortgage Senior Loan Officer, Graham Parr. Hey, Keith. Thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure. Hey, Graham. It's good to have you here again. So we're talking about 1031 tax deferred exchanges and the advantages of doing them and then the nuances and that the guidelines that the IRS says that you need to follow. The IRS gives real estate investors great advantages and 100 percent deferral of our capital gains tax. No limit to the amount of times that we do that. But we do need to follow some rules and there really aren't any exceptions to these rules. And you and I were just talking about this kind of as two men that have gone through 1031 exchanges before. We don't represent any qualified intermediaries at all. But from a lender perspective, you have some interesting insights on some efficiencies around 1031 tax deferred exchanges, like kind exchanges that some don't. So Tell us a little bit about what 1031 exchanges apply to and what situations one can take advantage of those under. Well, and like you said, Keith, we're going to approach this thing as two investors talking, but I'm also kind of going to give my opinions as it comes to lending and some of the things you need to know about, some of the obstacles you may run into. I've worked with uh, several other lending institutions that sometimes just don't understand how to do a 1031 exchange to the point where they just don't even do them. So you got to make sure that you got with the right lender that understands how to do them. Uh, And even the ones that do do them, sometimes when it gets into the underwriting department, when the, um, a lot of the guidelines that were written for a lot of the lenders, it's almost as when they went to the IRS guidelines for lack of better words and did some cutting and pasting and put it into the lending guidelines. So the underwriters are going through and reading these guidelines on how to approach a 1031 exchange, and sometimes they think they need to be arbitrators of the exchange. Good example is, let's say you're buying four properties, and the lender has two files for two properties, but they don't have for the other two. Well, so the underwriter will look at it and say, okay, you've got so much money in the exchange, but you're only using this much money for these two here. And they'll come back and do a condition for the loan file saying, 
what are you going to do with the other two? In my opinion, it's none of their business. But for a lot of lenders and a lot of underwriters, they want that answer because they that's their flavor for risk. And they want to make sure they feel comfortable with doing this exchange. And what they're trying to prevent, needless to say, is seeing if there's going to be any more exposure of you truly going out and buying two more properties. They want to validate that now, but you may not have even identified those other two properties. So it's a very difficult answer to say. So keep that in mind when you're working with lenders. If they don't understand that exchange, it can make your life extremely miserable. Now, I personally have done several myself over the last 20 years. I'm in the process of concluding three of them myself, which should be completed here hopefully in the next 30 days. And I did it for the same reasons anyone else would do a 1031 exchange. They're reorganizing their inventory, they're upgrading their inventory, and they're growing their portfolio like exactly why the 1031 exchange was designed to begin with, to help investors grow their inventory. The great example is individuals back before the 2008 I mean, they were doing a lot of exchanges because they had a lot of equity built up in a lot of their properties, whether it be owner-occupied or not owner occupied And so they were selling them, do a lot of exchanges. We see a turn in the market. Needless to say, we had a lot of depreciation. The market lost a lot of ground. They kind of went out off the playing field up until about two and a half years ago. And now they've started coming back strong because the equity is built back up in these particular properties. And people are making use of them again. So I highly recommend taking a look at your current inventory. Get with your accountant. See what's best for you to keep the property or sell it. Because, you know, for sometimes they may be looking at it from an accounting perspective. Well, how much have I depreciated this property? Do I need to sell this and go buy a new property? In my case, I felt as if that the properties themselves were tired and I needed to upgrade them. And the great thing about it is I went to turnkey providers, which in my opinion, were providing me brand new products, whether the property was built in 1960 or 1980 or 2010, whatever the case may be. Once I look at that product, it's all said and done. If the rehabber goes in and does a complete rehabilitation, I'm getting a brand new product, brand new AC units, brand new roofs, brand new appliances. It's, I don't have any more maintenance for quite some time. And that's kind of the some of the main reasons why I did what I did selling some of my properties and graduating to newer products. So there's all kinds of reasons to do it, but needless to say, it's all financial. And that's why we take advantage of this 1031 exchange. Yeah, that's right. Now, just to use an example, let's say that an investor wants to relinquish. They want to sell two properties that they have in, we'll use Dallas, because Dallas is a market that has had some good appreciation run up over time. They want to sell those two turnkey single family homes that they have in Dallas that have had substantial equity run up, and they want to go ahead and use that equity to exchange them for, say, four properties in Birmingham. And effectively, the investor doesn't have to come up with any additional money out of pocket. They're just using that equity in Dallas, and they're going ahead and purchasing four properties in Birmingham while they relinquish two. So what they've done now, and you touched on it, Graham, is, okay, now typically when they've bought turnkey, they bought properties that are fully renovated above and beyond what some of those sort of classic reasons for doing a 1031 exchange are, which is, well, what that typically does is you now own, you now control more real estate than you had when you had two in Dallas. Now you have four in Birmingham. You have smaller down payments and a lower equity position in those four replacement properties than you did in the two relinquished, probably just 20 to 25 percent down payments in Birmingham, whereas you might have had 50 percent equity in Dallas. And typically when you make these exchanges, you also increase your cash flow. And the advantage of doing a 1031 exchange is that you have deferred the capital gains tax. If you had $100,000 of equity in Dallas after the sales of those properties, you don't have to pay the 15% capital gains tax on that. And sometimes, depending on what state you reside in, you also have to pay a state capital gains tax. For example, I know at last check, California had a 9.3% state capital gains tax on top of the 15% federal capital gains gains tax. So since that's a total of 24.3%, if you didn't do a 1031 exchange and you just sold the two properties in Dallas, 
and took that 100k of equity, you would be taxed $24,300, for example, if you were a California resident. Plus, you would also have to pay the depreciation recapture if you do not do a 1031 exchange. So those are some of the more typical reasons that someone does a 1031, to grow the size of their portfolio, to increase their leverage ratio, to increase the cash flow. And you know, Graham, it goes back classically to something I often talk about, the fact that you are financially free has a lot more to do with the fact that you're debt free. Because when you buy four properties in Birmingham with those relinquished properties from Dallas, you've actually taken on more debt. But what you've done is you've outsourced more debt to tenants. You've typically increased your cash flow. So you've taken steps away from being debt free and taken steps toward being financially free. But there are some rules that you need to follow. So let's talk a little bit more about the rules that you need to follow in a 1031 exchange Graham. I want to compound on what you just said, and it all makes sense. Yeah, you might have increased your debt load, but somebody else is paying that debt load. Right. You've increased the value of your assets, plural. I'm in lending, and I've said this for years, not because I'm a lender, because I'm an investor. Make use of leverage. It's your friend, and that's what we're doing here with the exchange. You know, we may be taking a 50% equity position product and buying four we're making more money. So that's the whole reason for it. And that's why I totally agree with it. And the way I look at it, and there's a lot of individuals when they're buying rental properties, they say, well, go ahead and buy 10. Take all your money from the uh, cash flow from the 10 and pay down one. That's fine. That's a strategy. You can pay that down and then you've relinquished yourself of that down to zero cash or, you know, you paid it off. You A, have a free and clear property, or B, come back and do another loan because you freed up a space. Several different strategies. My strategy is I'm keeping that 30-year loan until I die because I know my cash flow today. I know what it's going to be like tomorrow. And, you know, a lot of people have different strategies. That's just my opinion. But as far as some of the, the uh, how exchanges work, I've done so many of them. I've seen all kinds of unique sell properties compared to their buy properties. The guidelines for IRS, it says you have to sell like as. That's the key word, like as. And what that means to me and what that means to a lender and what also mean to you is, is an income property to an income property. Now, here's a crazy example. Let's say you sell a gas station. It was income driven and you want to take that money and go and buy four or five properties. You can do it. It's income to income. As long as you abide by the guidelines set forth on the lending guidelines as well as the cash guidelines, and I refer to those as boots, which means taxations. And let's kind of get into that. Let's take a property that you sold for $100,000. Okay, like the two properties we relinquished in Dallas in this example. Yeah, let's say they sold for 100 or say 200 So now we're, you sold both of them for 200000 or 100 apiece. Now we're at 200000 they both had a $50,000 loan on it. So now you have to replace 200000 or more in one, two, or three properties. And you have to replace that leverage on the 100000 for one, two, or three properties. For simple numbers, you sell the property for 200000 You had two $50,000 loans. Now you had 100000 So you cannot go above a 200% rule which means when you're out there looking for properties to transition into, since you sold at 200, you cannot buy any more than 400, but you have to buy at least 200 or greater. So you won't experience any cash boot or taxation. Same thing with the loan. If you're buying one, two or three, the lending aspect of it is you have to have at least one, two or three loans totaling at least a hundred thousand or greater. So you won't experience any mortgage boot. Those are the primary keys to an exchange. The 200% rule is key. And there's other components that you might want to deal with as well. And as Keith, as you mentioned before, we're not a 1031 provider. The 1031 industry, I wouldn't say it's loosey-goosey, but it has no congressional oversight. There are no guidelines like they are for residential lending or for the real estate community. We're highly restricted and they keep a close eye on us. But on the 1031 exchange industry, there is no regulatory committees out there overseeing these. So I highly encourage you to get with a very reputable company because I've run toe to toe with some of these ones that are not so reputable. 
And when it gets down to saying, okay, we're ready to close, send the money, and they don't, well, that's a problem. There are several things of consideration I highly recommend that you get with a credible exchange. Ask a lot of questions. Call me. I'll give you my personal opinion on any of those. But there are some restrictions that you have to understand. Yeah, there are a number of rules that need to be followed, and there really aren't exceptions or flexibility or extensions to these rules or to these timelines. So from the time that you relinquish property, like we talked about selling the two properties in Dallas, for example, from the date of that sale, you have 45 days to identify replacement properties and 180 days from the date of sale to go ahead and close on those specified replacements. And the 200% rule was just one of a few choices that you have when you're going ahead and identifying replacement properties. And Graham's talking about the importance of you identifying a qualified intermediary, a QI, that's reputable. And the QI is basically the middleman that holds on to the funds when you go ahead and and sell the relinquished properties in Dallas in this example, those funds don't go to you, the seller. They go to the qualified intermediary, and they're held for a period of time until you go ahead and close on the replacement properties, and then they're released. So that's why you need a reputable qualified intermediary, and regulation on those is fairly lax. So one of the best things you can do is go ahead and select a qualified intermediary, which you need to have to do a 1031 tax deferred exchange so that someone doesn't take the money and run. Exactly. i tell you another little trick that I just learned recently in my uh, current exchange. I had, well, I had several properties to sell. I got, I narrowed it down to two exchanges with seven properties. Because I combined it into one 1031, which means I sold four properties and they all closed at the same time. We started that 45-day clock on that one exchange. What does that mean to me? I only pay one exchange fee. Because some of the exchange fees, if you did like four, there could be anywhere from $500 to $1,000 per property per sale. And another $250 to say $500, depending on the exchanger, on per buy. So that would have been a four thousand dollars plus another two or three thousand just to exercise the exchange and have the exchanger orchestrate the transaction for you. But if you get your timing right, you get with the right exchanger and they agree, I narrowed it down to I paid one fee for seven properties buying eight. So it helps out a lot to get the word with the right exchanger. Yeah, it does. And it sure takes some planning and it sure takes some coordination. And yeah, I don't know about you, Graham, but yeah, I felt a fair bit of anxiety and stress when I was going through my 1031s because there's a few buys, there's a few sales. You're going to have at least two. You're going to have at least one sale of your relinquished property and at least one purchase of your replacement property. And you do have different options you can choose. You don't just need to choose one replacement property. You can choose from some options. But, yeah, there is a fair amount of stress involved. And the important thing I want to tell the listener is you want to get your qualified intermediary involved early. You want to do this before you even sell the property that you're relinquishing. You don't want to involve your qualified intermediary when it's too late. So you really want to get them involved and get your mind wrapped around the 1031 exchange rules before you even sell the property that you want to go ahead and replace. And Graham touched on fees and just sort of a way to pay less in qualified intermediary exchange fees. One thing I remember from my last 1031 exchange is that actually the fees were relatively low compared to the sales commissions that I paid on a percentage basis. I typically paid more in sale commissions than I did in qualified intermediary fees. Exactly. And that's the great thing about working with the providers that you promote, Keith, because they're all turnkey providers. Technically, there are no commissions. In my opinion, it made it easier on me with my exchange to have these uh, providers, to have that product available for me to pick and choose the ones who were ready so I could close out on my exchange. Like you see, I've got an identification period of 45 days, and then I have to close in 180. Well, the great thing about working with all these providers, you know, you don't necessarily have to focus on one. If you'd like that product, but it's not going to be ready for a time period, that's fine. You can identify it and close it later. And that's some of the things that you potentially could run into problems with other lenders. Let me give you an example. Some lenders, once again, try to be arbitrators of the exchange. So let's say you've identified four and two of those properties were turnkey ready, appraisal ready, ready to go. So you go get the appraisals, get them back, ready to go close. But the lender says, well, what about these other two? 
well, we're still under rehab. It's not going to be done for another two, three, four weeks. Well, then we have to close them all at the same time. And I guarantee a lot of the lenders out there think like this. We don't. We'll go ahead and close out those two, and then we'll close out the other ones later, as long as you stay within the 180 days. A lot of the key advantages of working with the, the turnkey providers, because they have properties out there that you're not fighting for, because you just mentioned it a minute ago, you can over-identify. But to me, that's like over-identifying through the MLS market with real estate agents out there bidding on the same products with other real estate agents. You don't know if you're going to get that property or not, but you have to identify it because your clock's ticking. That's one of the main reasons for over-identification because you're just uncertain of what you're going to buy because you don't know if it's going to happen or not. So the great advantage, once again, to working with the turnkeys, you have more certainty going into the transaction than you would on the open market. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's somewhat of a, a closed market that way, and that does alleviate some of the stress when you're relinquishing turnkeys and especially when you're going ahead and replacing those with other turnkeys. Just for the investor, thinking about your long-term strategy and like, well, when are these capital gains tax payments going to catch up with me if I continue to do 1031 exchange and let equity build up in properties and then do another and a larger 1031 exchange? And the answer is effectively never. You never have to pay capital gains tax. There is an unlimited number of times to the amount of times that you can go ahead and make these deferrals. And then upon your death, the basis of those properties steps up so that your heirs basically don't have to pay any of these taxes either. Now, if you decide sometime during your life that you want to get out of the investment game and sell, then at that point, you do have to pay the accumulated capital gains tax amount on all those exchanges you've done, plus any depreciation recapture. So that's just something to keep in mind. Like you said, Keith, it can be stressful. You get with the right exchanger, you're going to be able to work it all out. I was fortunate enough to when I got down to number 10 property, I'm going to have a few dollars left over. Okay, so I'm going to throw it at the down payment portion of it. And I have a little bit lesser of a loan, but I've spent all the money. I got no boot, no taxation. So it can be done. Another great example, I had a guy today call me before the show. He's selling a property, $300,000. He's going to walk away with $300,000. He says, okay, I'm going to go ahead and buy three more properties at $100,000 down a piece. I'm going, well, how many loans do you have? He says, three. I said, well, why wouldn't you want to go buy seven instead of just three and spread your money out and make more money? He goes, well, that makes sense. Yeah, so you got to think this stuff through. If you don't, you're losing out on that, that additional surplus of passive income that you didn't think you were going to have. I'm telling you, this is really kind of wealth building essentially comes down to, Graham. I think this is it. This is growing your portfolio from that example you just gave from three properties up to seven properties without effectively using any more of your own money. This is powerful stuff and a huge incentive that real estate investors get. Governments incentivize people to do the things that they know are good for society, just like they disincentivize things that they think are bad for society, like putting a sin tax on cigarettes or something. So this is doing something good for society with doing 1031 exchanges and providing people with responsible housing. And it's basically a reward that the government gives us for doing good in society. Correct. So, Graham, any final thoughts on 1031 exchanges, especially coming from a lender perspective? just something that prospective borrowers ought to know about. I think we said it early on, you got to get with the right exchanger. Give me a call. I'll give you my personal preference. There are some good ones out there. And then, of course, you want to make sure that you get with the right lender that understands the 1031. Because if you don't, and I'm not going to mention, but it was one of the top four banks, a gentleman that decided to go with because he had his money there and you know, well, they've got my money. I feel warm and fuzzy because they got my money in my checking account. I might as well use them because they're, they're a big bank, so forth and so on. He said it was a complete nightmare. And then he came back to me and we did an exchange a year later, closed out five properties, smooth as silk. He goes, I don't know why I ever went to that other bank to begin with, because they just don't understand exchanges. So keep that in mind. Yeah, it really takes some planning and it really takes a lot of communication. When someone looks to move and reposition equity and create arbitrage and increase their velocity of money, you basically have a couple primary choices. Number one is a cash out refinance, but the other is a 1031 tax deferred exchange. And it's just the latter, that exchange, that's what enables you to get all of the equity out of a property because you sold it, unlike a cash out refinance where you always need to keep a certain equity position. 
Graham Parham, how can our listeners connect with you? I'm still, once again, a kind of a 24-7 guy. You can reach me anytime, day or night, or even over the weekend. I have a direct toll-free number. That is at 855-326-6802. And after hours, if I'm available, I will answer that phone. If I am not, I won't. And if you leave a message, I'll get back with you in a timely fashion. And Graham sure will follow up with you. Graham Parham, thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Thank you, Keith. Have a good day. Yeah, well, thanks for the help there, Graham. If you're looking for a mortgage loan officer, Graham is more 1031 friendly than others. Lean on your qualified intermediary a lot in the process, especially when you go through this for the first time. When I went through my first 1031 exchange, I phoned my QI so often with questions that I wondered how they were making any money off the relatively low fees that they charged me, so I really played it safe on my first one. In fact, when I sent in the identification form to the QI on the 45th day, I emailed it and paper mailed it, and I even found and used a fax machine transmission as a backup three different ways. So a 1031 tax deferred exchange is a great benefit to us as real estate investors, but there's quite a bit of planning involved and there are strict rules to follow. Until next time, I'm Keith Weinhold and I'm here every week to help you build your wealth. Don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.